Hello there everybody, welcome along to EFL Debate. Uh, I'm talking about all 72 clubs across the EFL between mid-June and mid-July. There's already been a few of these episodes uploaded onto YouTube and Spotify, so go check those out. And while you're at it, give us a subscribe and a follow on those channels. But once, of course, you're done with this episode, which is on Wickham Wanderers, and who better to be joined to talk about the chair boys than Phil Catchpole from Wanderers TV. How are you, Phil? I'm very good, thanks, Gav. Thanks for having me on. I've just got back from holiday, so I'm uh, I'm a little relaxed. Although I was up early to do the fixture release stuff, so yeah, uh, it feels like it feels like the season started now. Properly. Yeah, it brings it all to life, doesn't it? The fixture release there. Yeah. Where did you go on holiday, first of all? Uh, I went to Mallorca, which was great. The sun yeah. shone and uh, my little boy was in the swimming pool every day and he had a great time, which which means that we did. So, yeah, so it was good. It's good to get away and get 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 head out of Twitter and socials for a week and just, uh, yeah, you know, look at the sun and the sea a bit and go, yeah, you know. Life's good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We all need that sometimes. Um, bringing it back to the, to the business then, Phil, um, fixture release day, I always think, is such a, a sort of romantic day in the English football calendar, really. And um, you mentioned your kid there. I always feel a bit like a kid on fixture release day just because I'm so excited to plan my dates for the season ahead and, and know what's in store. Absolutely. And, you know, from, from someone who's lucky enough to work at a club or around the media and, and be around the fixtures, uh, it's basically um, our blueprint from August to, to the start of May or into May if you get into the playoffs. So it's quite nice knowing that you're going to be in Carlisle on the 20th of April. You know, who else knows that? <laughs> Who else knows? It's a very, very small percentage of the population, I'm sure. Um, you also want to check out what your Tuesday night away games are going to be and whether you've got too many killers or... Yeah. Well, we looked at the ups and downs of League One and as much as I love going to Accrington and Morecambe, they're great clubs, they did tend to sometimes be on a Tuesday night. Uh, I, do, I do remember spending... Uh, most of, in fact, nearly all of Valentine's Day in a car with uh, Matt Cecil of Wickham Wanderers uh, oh, driving to he's actually the true he's well, the exactly. true You know, if you don't love your club, what well, you know, that definitely underlines the love for your club. So, yeah, spent all of Valentine's Day with Matt Cecil on the M6, it seemed, uh, to see Wickham Wanderers play. <laughs> Did you sh share, a little, share a little box of chocolates? Or... Oh, it was, be it was beautiful, Paris. mate. <laughs> it was it was absolutely beautiful, and uh, we probably, I think we actually spent most of it coming up with absolutely awful Valentine's Day poems uh, to put on the Twitter when we eventually arrived uh, through the traffic. But, uh, oh, right. you know, such is the glamorous lifestyle of football club media. Absolutely, yeah. Well, um, I'm glad you found ways of keeping yourselves occupied. Um, in terms of Wickham Wanderers, then this season, Phil, I the, I want to go to the the big. The big picture, first of all, which is how much of next season is a little bit of a rebuild? Because after 11 years of Gareth Ainsworth, Matt Bloomfield's his own man, even though he's a Wickham Wanderers legend. He's got his own style that he wants to put his stamp on this team. There's got to be some patience with that. At the same time, Wickham Wanderers have um, got into the playoffs in two of the last three seasons at this level. They came very close to that um, for, for large portions of, of last season and were obviously spent a year in the championship as well. So how do you sort of balance, I suppose, the acceptance there is a little bit of a transitional feel to this season with actually the ambition to try and push again? I think we're in quite a unique place as a, as a football league club and, and certainly in League One in the fact that we've um, we lost a manager last season that has been at the club an enormous amount of time. Um, so whoever follows uh, was in for a tough job. I thought Matt Bloomfield coming in at the time he did off the back of five Wickham Wanderers consecutive victories. Um, uh, we knew the call would come one day for Gareth, although I think a few of us may have thought it may never come and we never wanted it to. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it did come and, and obviously Gaz has gone with the club's best wishes and the fans as well. Um, he left us in a in a much, much better place than when he took over, which is what managers are there to do. Um, but let's also remember at the start of his tenure, it took him his time to get his chops right, you know, and to get his managerial teeth stuck into what he needed to be doing. He got the time at Wickham Wanderers. Historically, we're a club that back managers and give them time. Um, albeit, I think, you know, Gaz, uh, by his own admission, would have been fired uh, at the end of his first full season. Um, the club couldn't afford to do it. And the time afforded to Gareth Ainsworth then 
meant he became the manager that he became and mm. and, and that what everyone in the EFL is now aware of. Um, and I think with Matt Bloomfield, what we have is a is an exceptional young coach, someone who's steeped in the history of the club, someone who's loved by the fan base. So he's in a bit of a unique position there as well. But obviously, it's a results business. Um, he came into a situation last season um, almost unique as well in football. Like you know, normally a manager goes, it's because of a firing or, in this case, uh, um, the poaching and the time of it. Um, was pretty crucial. Um, and he was in a bit of a no-win situation because, of course, he's his own man. He's got his own ideas. Uh, he's incredibly hardworking and passionate about what he wants to see on the football pitch. Um, but equally, it was at that point of the season where you don't have enough time to do that uh, mm. and to put that across. So I think this pre-season... Uh, and albeit not in the playoffs, has enabled the club to have a proper break as well. And it's given um, Matt Bloomfield the chance to then start to implement his own personality and style on the club in every way, shape and form. And it reminds me a little bit of the season after Wickham Wanderers nearly went out of the Football League, where Gareth Ainsworth didn't have any money and he changed everything he could. He changed the dugouts yeah. around. He changed the size and dimensions of the pitch. He yeah. made the players wear certain clothes and to do this and whatever. Uh, all things that were changed, he decorated the training ground on his own budget and stuff. Um, he started wearing a suit as well, didn't he? I seem to think. Exactly that, yeah, exactly that, to kind of uh, to do that. And I think uh, Matt Bloomfield is in his own version of that now. Um, mm. because it's now his chance, the clean break. Uh, we've lost some senior members of the squad. Um, there's recruitment to be done uh, and excitement around that as well. And it will mean that his philosophy, his style, his characters, how he wants to, to go about things, the changes he wants to make everywhere around the club. Uh, and now that time is now afforded for him to do this under his way. So in a way, weirdly, albeit he came in at the stage of 15 games to go, I think really the the true, true start of his tenure and his where he's got licence to impose himself on his club started at the final whistle at Pompey on the last day of the season. Yeah, well, hopefully he can. Uh, hopefully he can really uh, stamp his uh, stamp his identity on this team over the summer. Who do you think are going to be the players that Matt Bloomfield will look at in this Wanderers squad and think, yes, I can really build this playing identity around you? Well, I think we've done a lot of recruitment. Um, a bit, I say recruitment, but in terms of like securing um, players, in terms of the existing squad, you know, we look at the the players under contract we have at Wickham Wanderers: Max Strier in goal, Ryan Tapazoli, Chris Farino at centre back, uh, Josh Cohen in midfield, uh, Sam Vokes up front. You look at the spine of that team. OK, they all need to be fit and firing every week, which is what we struggled with last season. But we had uh, a very short um, off-season break due to the playoff final last season and the early start to the World Cup. We saw a huge amount of injuries at the start of last season. I'm hoping with the proper break, um, the players have rested and recuperated a huge part of sports sciences in, in the r and R role. Um, and, you know, with that, with that spine of the team that already exists, uh, at Wickham Wanderers, I think there's a fantastic framework to build and add players around. Um, interestingly, talking to Rob Kuhig um, about a month ago um, on Ringing the Blues, he was saying that the strategy of recruitment it will change slightly. In uh, Wickham, haven't really used the low market at all in the in the Kuhig era. Um, we had Chem Campbell come in on the, on the back end of last season uh, from Wolverhampton Wanderers, um, but before that, we haven't really dipped our toe in the low market. And I think Rob's probably looked down the road at Plymouth, where his good friend is the chairman, and they had a phenomenal season. Uh, the first half of the season, a lot of people were saying, well, it was down to the low knees. Um, you've still got to sign the right ones. You've still got to integrate them into the squad. Um, but they did fantastically well with that. And, and even though they lost a few of them in January, the momentum and the recruitment, I think, saw them through. And, you know, I know that neither of us um, tipped them for the title. Um, but they did a I'll phenomenal have them job. Second, actually, Phil. I think you'll find. I can't. I can't remember who, who was first again. <laughs> <laughs> he left himself wide open to that game. I'm sorry. I, I, I wasn't going to mention it like this. Um, <laughs> but I mean, in all seriousness, the loan market. Um, I mean, MK Dons are the other other side of the coin, aren't they? Because the season before last, they played the loan market superbly well. Uh, mm. Not quite so well last season, um, but it has. I think there's been an indication there from the chairman that we'll be looking at, um, uh, at maybe three or so players 
from a, from either a Premier League or a Championship um, um, academy. And I think you know that sort of business gets done a bit later on again, which is another challenge. Um, we've seen the likes of Pompey. I think they're up to six signings already. Uh, mm -hmm. Wickham fans uh, on social media smashing their keyboard saying, where are the signings? Um, and understandably so, because that's what fans do. Um, but yeah, I know uh, we have a new um, uh, head of recruitment now at Wickham Wanderers. It's a slight reorganisation of, of the role and the system here at Wickham Wanderers, again, brought in by the manager, Black Matt, Matt Bloomfield. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's a change of set up there. It's someone that Matt knows very, very well, and it's going to be integral, I think, to how he sees that structure, structural side of the club working. And everyone's very excited to see what that produces. Yeah, of course. Um, obviously, I, um, I think the last couple of summers, Wickham haven't really got sort of um, fl flown out the traps in terms of recruitment. And I use that analogy as though it's a good thing to, 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 to go really bright and early in recruitment, but it doesn't always work out. Sometimes there can be a value in being a bit more patient with it. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, Phil, was if the squad is a little bit thin going into the start of the early pre-season games, is there an opportunity for some of the lads from the B team to actually show what they can do before the club weighs up what they're going to need maybe later down the window? Well, I think we've seen the development squad really sort of come into the fore um, last season as well. We had the likes of Christy Ward um, getting first team minutes. Uh, you know, he'd signed from Brocklehurst uh, last summer. Uh, really highly thought of and um, the coaching staff around the training ground as well. Uh, very excited about him and to see him getting minutes in that running, um, I think was was that was was really positive to see. And let's not forget as well, before Matt Bloomfield left Wickham to join Colchester, uh, he was a coach uh, in the in the Gareth Ainsworth setup and was doing a lot of work, one to one work with those young development players. So these are people that he knows very very well. Um, TJ the Bar we saw playing more and more an integral part in the second half of the season. Uh, he got his first senior goal. Uh, he racked up five assists. Uh, he's just made two more international appearances. Uh, in in this uh, international window against France and the Republic of Ireland. Um, he's someone um, that the club are very excited about as well, as are the fans having seen him play as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's others in the system as well. Your Luca Woodhouse is around and, 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 and as well, and there's other younger players in there. Um, so, yeah, it could well present that opportunity. This development squad, you know, Anis Fometti, Chris Farino have shown the path. Um, and we've got to see what's coming down the line with this. And and obviously the recruitment is obviously for the first team, but there will be recruitment in the development squad as well. Uh, and Sam Grace and the team have done a fantastic job of that um, in, in the past. And, you know, to see on deadline day, as heartbreaking as it was for us all to see Anis leave Wicca Wanderers, mm -hmm. uh, to see him now go and make his full international debuts uh, and become uh, a championship player. And uh, I think perhaps with the moves that are coming at Bristol City, uh, if Alex Scott moves on, that may well open the door to further minutes for Anis Fometti. And uh, we'll all be looking at him and thinking, wow, he was one of ours, as we all were with Ebery Chiesa when he made his England debut the other week. Although we never owned him, he's come out in the media and been absolutely fantastic about Wickham Wanderers, saying that he wouldn't be doing that without Wickham Wanderers. And, uh, and I have to agree with him. Yeah, you, you go to Wickham Wanderers and then you'll play for England. I think that's how it works, Phil. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Steve Guppy, I mean, he did it. <laughs> absolutely. It's, uh, there's, there's a theme here. Um, I, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Credit to Sam Grace for the work they've done and um, to, to poach someone like Mametti from Woodford Town and then get him to, to do what he's done, I think speaks volumes for what the club's done. You mentioned uh, Che Debar there, Phil, and... Um, I think that last season under Bloomfield, his link-up play with Brandon Hanlon really excited me because Che Debar looks like a really canny sort of subtle operator. You know, likes to go between the lines a little bit. And then you've got Hanlon with that um, that athleticism. who's always a threat in behind. Um, those two look a real combination, don't they? Yeah, uh, TJ's a really exciting player because he's... He's kind of, he's a bit like a battering ram as well. He's quite short, but he's exceptionally strong uh, and he's completely fearless. Um, but he's got a, a great touch as well. Um, I think what would be really lovely to see is a bit more composure in front of goal. And I think that will come with game time. This is someone who's had to be very patient with injuries. 
uh, and and also sort of the, uh, training as well uh, and waiting for those opportunities to come. They came like, at the end of last season and I think he's developed really, really well and I'm looking forward to seeing him kicking on to the next level and I really think he will. Uh, but you're right, um, uh, Duncan Alexander, up to Joe, big Wickham fan uh, of a certain age like myself, described him as a, as a Steve McGavin sort of player. He was a really classy... Oh, Steve McGavin. Yeah, yeah, he was a really yeah, classy player. Yeah, I at, um, at Birmingham City actually in 94, yeah, 95 yeah. and uh, Barry Fry. Yeah, but he was a player that, like you say, could play between the lines, could pick a pass, but also had an eye for goal as well. And I think when TJ adds goals into his game, which I know they're coming, um, then we've got a really exciting prospect on our hands. Yeah, that sounds really, uh, really encouraging. And um, I, I like that uh, that combination, actually, with uh, Hanlon, Debar, and then you had Jim Campbell on loan last season, whether there'll be another loan sort of similar to replace him. And then we've kind of got to talk about Gareth McCleary, Phil, because I always can't believe how old, how old, because he, he doesn't look like he ages. It's like some of the turns of pace that he's shown uh, last season was quite phenomenal. I mean, he must be um, having a brilliant, uh, brilliant vegan diet. That must be what does it for him. He is phenomenal. And uh, as he's mentioned once or twice on Wondrous TV, uh, his shirt is very rarely on uh, around uh, <laughs> uh, non-match day. But then equally, if I looked as good as Gareth McCleary, I would be wearing a shirt now. We, we don't want to that. see that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you actually don't, especially after a week on holiday. Uh, so, um, but it's, it goes to show again, you know, Wickham have, have done this in the past. They've got, um, they've got mileage out of players at, in the autumn of their career. And like you, I can't believe that, that Gareth McCleary is the age he is. I, I want to see his passport personally. Um, but it's testament to the, his character and his professionalism. Um, and equally, like Adebayo Akinfema was the same. You know, he played until he was 40. Um, and because of his commitment to his own body and keeping himself in shape, knowing his limits, and also you have to be managed correctly. And I think that will be a huge part of, of this season, I think with our recruitment and if you are bringing in a few low knees, that's naturally going to bring down the average age of the squad. But I think with the older players that we have, um, Gareth McCleary, Sam Vokes into his 30s, although I think he's got many years left, um, it's about managing these players and their load. Um, and I think Wickham have been exceptionally good at that in the last few years. Um, uh, I think with the, with the injuries last season, it put pressure on that situation. Um, but I think with Gareth McCleary, uh, managed correctly um, and 100% fit, uh, I don't think there's many better in the division. You mentioned Sam Vokes there, Phil. Um, I feel like Sam Vokes has brilliant strength in terms of being an act ball and uh, bringing others into play. And um, certainly in the 21-22 uh, season, he was absolutely outstanding. Um, I also wonder if, you know, if uh, Matt Bloomfield wants maybe a little bit more pace up top, um, you know, especially if he wants to play a slightly more of a pressing game, perhaps, um, and if you want to change the style a little bit as, as well, is there a possibility that Sam Vokes becomes more of a plan B rather than your sort of guaranteed starter? Yeah, we'd be in, we're all sort of very keen to see what the, the, the Matt Bloomfield philosophy is in terms of, like you say, the off the ball pressing, uh, the breaking down of a low block of other teams, etc. How we approach that final third, the differences in that and the tools available. Um, Sam Vokes was, um, you know, his contract was extended last season when Matt, when Matt Bloomfield was manager. Um, but, you know, his pedigree and track record speak for themselves. Uh, and I think he struggled with injury last season. They came at very cruel times. He got injured in pre-season. Again, referring back to that short period um, we had um, between the playoff final and, and, and the kickoff, um, I don't think really suited uh, a lot of the players. And um, we saw that uh, borne out in injury. And I think when you're injured in pre-season, it does tend to sort of have a, a hangover throughout the season where you're chasing your tail a little bit. He picked up another injury shortly after Matt Bloomfield um, took control, um, which came at a really cruel time as well. Um, but I think in terms of um, with Sam Vokes' play, yeah, I think there's obviously quicker forward players out there, but his hold-up play, his aerial ability, um, and I think something that's really underrated in, in the Sam Vokes locker is his vision, his touch and his passing, a bit like... Mm that Adebayo Akinfema never really ever got the credit uh, with his feet that he should have. But, yeah. but folks, is an incredibly intelligent player. And sure. and also with experience, um, you know where to be and good strikers know where to be, uh, no matter how fast you are 
if they know where to be, they tend to get there when the time is right. And Sam Vokes has, has proved that at the very top level, at international level. Um, so I'm, I'm absolutely convinced he's an integral part of the plans for Matt Bloomfield and, and the philosophy he will have. Yeah, for sure. Um, so too, Jack Grimmer, because I think um, for Gareth Ainsworth's tenure at Wickham, we talk about this um, this sort of core of players, your, your Jacobsons, your Akin Fenwers, your Bloomfields and um, your Anthony Stewart's. And it feels to me like Jack Grimmer is kind of the, the next one on the conveyor belt, if you like, coming into that bracket. It felt like last season he really matured into another leader for this Wanderers side, which with some of the departures um, on the field was actually really, uh, really, really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think it was Jurgen Klopp, wasn't it, about, you know, about improving players. You know, we sit here in a transfer window and everyone getting excited about signing new players. But there's a huge amount of value and, and not really enough spoken about actually developing the players that you have. Uh, and it doesn't mean just young players. This is players who are sort of in the prime. You know, you like Sir Jack Grimmer, who I've put in that bracket. Um, a fantastic right back. But last season, I think he played superbly at centre back. Uh, initially due to injury as well. But I think he then showed that he was there uh, a more than reliable um, centre-back for Wickham Wanderers. Um, and it shows you that with coaching and development as a player, you can keep being, you can keep learning. And Wickham have shown that with, with many players down the years, as you just said. And I think Jack Grimmer is a, is a really good example of that. And then off the pitch as well, um, I really saw Jack growing as a character, as a leader. Um, we, we spoke about David Stockdale and Adebayo Akin Fem were leaving um, uh, Adams Park and it, it created a lot of airspace because that a lot of the airspace was filled by by our old leaders in Stockholm and, and Bayer. Um, and it took a little while for those those voices to come through. David Wheeler, Jack Grimmer were certainly characters that, that, that rose into that airspace. And, you know, Jack is, I'm not just saying this because he's from Aberdeen and he's a tough Scotsman, but if you're in a fight, if you had Jack alongside, you'd be quite happy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think probably you could argue it was his best season for Wickham Wanderers to date last year. So hopefully he can uh, really build on that. Um, what about some of the, um, you met, we've mentioned some of the uh, the older players at Wickham Wanderers. And I, um, there's part of me that wonders, Joe Jacobson, for example, spent 45 minutes as Wickham Wanderers interim manager. I think we can all agree he did an excellent job in that time, um, undefeated as well. So, uh, so really impressive. Um, but is there a possibility that he maybe takes a bit more of a background role and maybe does a bit of what Matt Bloomfield did a couple of years ago, where he maybe moved into a sort of player coach type of type of role? Uh, I'm not sure in terms of an official coaching capacity, but uh, you know, as 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 a as a club captain and a senior. Where well, he is the senior player in terms of, you know, he's been at Wickham Wanderers. This will be his 10th season. He's got a testimonial on the 29th of July against Cardiff City, his boy club at Adams Park, um, you know, which will be a wonderful occasion for Joe. Um, but yeah, I think uh, chatting to Jason McCarthy this morning on our fixture release show, and he was saying that, that Joe is that sort of character that you can go and speak to about yeah. anything, about football, about life, whatever. And he's that calm, wise head. He's not a screamer or a shouter. He leads by example. He's a fantastic professional, as, you, as you'd as you expect for someone of his age and position that he's in. Um, sure. He's looked after himself really, really well. Um, last season, I think um, when we played a back three, the, the, the left-hand side of that back three, uh, Joe Jacobson showed that to be uh, incredibly comfortable for him. And, he, you know, he kind of pointed out as a youngster, he started as a left winger. And as he's been getting older, he's been moving further and further back. Whether he plays in goal this season for Wickham, we'll see. Um, but I think that left-hand side of a back three um, is excellent for him. And I think he could do a job in any team in League One in that level. Um, there's Fans have always had their doubts over the last few years about him as a left-back of a four. Um, if you get a very pacey winger or isolated, uh, then do you have to then adjust your formation or other? But, you know, JJ, due to the injury to Jordan the Beta last season, at the end of last season, played a huge amount of games at left back and, uh, and and wasn't really left wanting too many times in that position. And again, with the Vokes point, um, with age comes experience and none more experience than Joe Jacobson. So I think it's fantastic he's around for another year. I'm loving, I would love to see how his, his role does evolve. Um, but I think it will be very similar to what it has been in the last years in terms of his off-the-field character and personality. And, uh, and it'd be interesting to see what the, uh, the Matt Bloomfield philosophy is, what the, the chosen formation is, and, and where Joe Jacobson would fit into that. 
Yeah, no question. He's a, um, a an incredibly significant dressing room influence. Uh, do you expect, with you mentioned Jordan Obita's injuries there, do you expect the club to recruit another left back this summer? Yeah, yeah, I think that's an area where we need, um, I think we were light in that position uh, in the second half of the season, uh, highlighted by by Jordan's injury. Um, I think uh, even in the development squad, I didn't see that there was a young person, a young player there who could maybe sit on the bench to cover that position as well. So I think that's something that the club have highlighted um, as well. Um, I think in central midfield as well, um, with the departures of Nick Freeman, Dominic Gate, Curtis mm. Thompson, uh, all huge characters, players, personalities at the club. Um, there's uh, a huge amount of recruitment to be done there too, um, as well. Um, again, both on the pitch and off the pitch, the recruitment at Wickham has been very famous down the years of character, character, character. Mm. Um, so I'm sure that will also continue. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's that's where we're looking, I think. Left back, uh, central midfield. Um, I mean, there's... I think seven or eight gaps in the squad um, that we, we that we'll see. Um, you know, I can't bring in news of any at the moment. So, of course. I'm, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't expect. I'm, you to. I'm in the same position as the fans, excitingly waiting for news. Also, uh, have the slightly privileged position of know the amount, huge amount of hard work that's going in uh, off the pitch uh, to to get the to get these new signings in. Yeah, never in question from from that point of view. Um, you mentioned there about some of the outgoing midfielders they fill with uh, Dom Gape uh, and Curtis Thompson, and I just wonder whether Matt Bloomfield would actually maybe not necessarily look for a carbon copy of those midfielders because the start the change of style probably means that what Wickham Wanderers need from a central midfielder now might be a little bit different to what it what they've needed um previously there's a lad called um Elliot Watt for instance at Salford that I'm a, a huge fan of do you think that financially the club is going to be in a position where it can pay um pay can pay a, a reasonable uh, six figure fee no, I mean Wickham Wanderers are in a in a much better financial position uh, than than they have been in in the, in recent history. Um, if we're talking back to the Gareth Ainsworth transfer windows, where uh, you know it was beg, steal, and borrow, and and go to the scrap heap and and, and develop players, um, we're not in that position anymore. But equally, uh, we're a club uh, that gets you know six thousand through the gate. Um, and some of the big hitters of our division have now left us in Ipswich and Sheffield Wednesday. Mm. Um, we still have Derby County, etc. Uh, we want to be sustainable um, as well. Um, and and I think fans will want sustainability as well. I don't think the majority of our fan base are sort of, you know, let's go gung-ho for the championship and, and mm. spend beyond our means and get into trouble down that way. It has to be done sustainably. Um, so, yeah, so, of course, there will be a time if a club can come in and say we can offer this, this player uh, more money. Um, but then it comes down to the character um, again, doesn't it? If it's a player at the stage of the career where they're worried about the the money or the length of their contract or the value of their of their contract, which in the lower leagues, leagues one and two, is is not a derogatory thing to say. It's a, yeah. it's a fact of life. People have mortgages, children, families, etc. Um, so I'm not I'm not um, doing anybody down by saying that they're wrong to take more money. Um, but equally, if it's younger, hungrier players who are thinking, actually, what I need at this stage of my career is game time. Uh, and the ability to impress and maybe use Wickham Wanderers as a stepping stone, which again, I'm not being derogatory about our club, but if they want to come and have a fantastic two seasons at Wickham and get and get a move like Anish Sumeti, then then in two years' time, we've had a great player for two years and we'll find the next one. And that's where we're at now. We're looking for the next Anish Sumeti. Maybe they're in the building already uh, and developing those players. But yeah, we can't compete with with the bigger clubs with with the financial resources of, of if derby county dare i say blackpool as well but equally some of those bigger boys in league one this season reading and wigan athletic have had um have had well documented problems uh financially so maybe um they won't be out doing us either um we'll have to yeah. wait and see but uh, as wickham the message is always we have to cut our cloth accordingly um you know we have offered um uh, in the last window, Rob Kuig was saying they have offered money for players, deals that didn't get across the line in January, but there were transfer fees offered. And I remember there was a huge amount of time at Wickham where we didn't pay a transfer fee. Um, so that in itself is a development, but there we are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's uh, let's touch on the what the wider league then, Phil, because I think it's interesting you bring that up. Um, as much as um, I mentioned at the top of the show that there is a, a sense of transition for Wickham Wanderers, I also think there's a sense of opportunity for Wickham this season because when you look at three teams going out of the league in terms of 
huge clubs in Sheffield Wednesday and Ipswich Town and an incredibly smart, well-running club in Plymouth Argyle who won the league. I think it's fair to say the league has been uh, weakened. I think there's question marks over all the clubs coming down, um, especially uh, Wigan and Reading with the financial issues that, that you've mentioned there, um, to, to maybe a lesser extent Blackpool. Um, but I feel like there's probably three teams that I'm very confident in saying will finish in the top six next season. And I feel like there's uh, three uh, other spots in the top six that you, you a team like Wickham could say, I'm not really scared of anyone anyone else. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a much more open, even division. Um, I'm pleased to see the backs of, of Ipswich and Sheffield Wednesday uh, only because of the resources available to them um, because, you know, they, they went up and so they should. Um, and congratulations as well because it was a tough division to get out of. Um, sure. And nine, 96 points to get you third place. Um, and yeah, it shows you how difficult it was last season. Um, but it creates a much more level playing field in terms of, mm. of what's offered on finance. But then on the other side of that coin, it's Wickham Wanderers. We've done it in recent history. We've shown that it isn't about the size of your bank balance or the wages that you're paying or the transfer fees that you're paying. Um, and again, Sheffield Wednesday showed it last season. If it was down to that, they would have got promoted automatically and they didn't. Um, so there is always that competitive nature and, and football is the great leveller of that. And with great coaching and, and being a well-run club and having the correct strategy, um, that you can overcome that. Um, I think with Plymouth, it's we saw a, a succession plan from the season before where they overcame that incredible disappointment on the final day. But let's not forget, they had a really good season that year as well. And then they mm -hmm. followed it up by stepping up again. This yeah. wasn't a fluke one-off season where they've gone from the bottom to the top. This was a steady implementation of an excellent strategy in a well-run club. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll be looking at other clubs who are perhaps on that, on, that, on that sort of trajectory. And I look at someone like Bolton, for example, who've had a really good season last season, got to the playoffs, and they will now be looking at that top two positions. Uh, mm -hmm. Another big club, uh, they've backed the manager um, and, you know, decent squad. Uh, they're coming from a decent uh, sort of retained list as well. So they'll be up there, I think, um, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, and then there's a, there's a huge amount of teams in the middle there who will be thinking, right, yeah, actually, um, we're all aiming for that top six. I think there's probably going to be about 15 of us in there. Um, Wickham will obviously have the recent experience, albeit we've got a new, a new, uh, new regime now. And we'll be looking at how we implement that strategy and how we go. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think the other thing is, um, I remember a couple of seasons ago when you mentioned that Argyle side missed out on the playoffs with 80 points and Fleetwood stayed up with 40 points. There's no way there's going to be a 43-point difference between the relegation zone and the playoffs in League One next season, I don't think so. I think it's going to be a luck, more of a level playing field, hopefully a more uh, even league and fingers crossed that Wickham Wanderers can, can really thrive in that. Um, talk to me about Max Stryak, Phil, because I I loved watching, you can, I can see you smiling just at me mentioning the name because I love that video you did with him in terms of the doggy doggy daycare uh, stuff. So he's clearly um, clearly an animal lover at heart, but he's also a good goalkeeper as well. Yeah, fantastic keeper. And I think, you know, Rob Kuig, our chairman, um, held his hands up saying the, the club, um, um, you know, one of the reasons we, we came up to a slow start um, was not having a senior goalkeeper in the building for the first five games of the season. Uh, due to a, a you know a well documented uh, transfer saga with a bigger club in the Premier League uh, and, a, and a loan situation, and that's not to do down Tyler Dickinson who, who played in those first five games, but this was a guy who was getting his first taste of senior football. Um, and if you if you are a team sort of serious about going up, you can't really base uh, your season around that. Uh, where Max did come in through the through the door um, was incredibly quiet and shy. Uh, and that that changed quite quickly. Uh, he's your absolutely classic goalkeeper. He's uh, he's barking mad, and uh, pardon the pun, uh, in a great way. Uh, he's a big character, and um, was was featured in all of the votes for Player of the Season. The fans as well, and the players uh, had an exceptional season for Wickham Wanderers. Um, but again, one of these great characters around the place, and uh, yeah, was able to confirm with me at the dog rescue place that he in fact loves dogs much more than humans. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Um, 
Yeah, well, listen, what what a season, what a season he's had. Um, I've always been a massive fan of uh, of Ryan Tafazoli, Phil. Um, he's obviously had a little bit of bad luck with injuries in uh, in recent seasons, and I suspect he would feel he could maybe have pushed on to championship level, um, more consistently had um w- w- without them. But how important do you see his partnership with Chris Farino being next year? It could be classic. You've got your left foot of Tafazoli, your right foot of Chris Farino, experience of Tafazoli, the rawness of and pace of Farino. It, mm. On paper, it, it, it bears out to be a, a fantastic partnership. But the, uh, the, the big question mark is, uh, which w- would have been raised from last season, is how many games can they physically play together? Because there was injury problems for both of them. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, subscribers to Ryan Tafazoli's YouTube channel will see the incredible amount of work that he does uh, at the training ground, away from the training ground, his nutrition, his diet, fantastic insights into the life of a professional footballer. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I feel he's due a bit of luck this season in terms of uh, a decent run uh, of injuries. Um, he's he's quite a laid back character, but I don't think I've met anyone more compet- any more competitive than Ryan Tafazoli in my life. Uh, you know, he's highly ambitious as well, um, and yeah, another one of the, you know a different character. Uh, but a great character as well. And, you know, like any squad, you need a real blend of character. Uh, and, yeah, he's that. And it's it's great to see him out on the pitch because, you know, tall left-footed centre-backs, you know, the, the, you don't see many of those around, especially in the no. lower leagues. Um, they get so a think, premium, don't they? Yeah, so I think, um, uh, yeah, he has played championship at Hull um, as well. Um, but, yeah, I, mean, it's, uh, I think, yeah, that combination of him and Chris Farino could be very exciting. Um, I think big Chris is... Uh, like Anis Fometi, a, a product of uh, of the development situation at Wickham Wanderers, an incredible story personally of him sort of leaving football and going to university and then realising that wasn't for him and then by pure chance being picked up by Wickham Wanderers um, and yeah and really gr- grasping that opportunity uh, with both hands. So another great character as well, um, you know, and, and a real leader despite his young years. Uh, I think this is a big big season for him. Um, uh, and I, I know. Uh, Matt Bloomfield's very excited about his potential. Gareth Ainsworth, um, when he was at Wickham, spoke um, as highly of Chris Freno as he did of Anis Fometti. Obviously, two very different players, two different positions. But, you know, big commanding centre-backs as well who, who, who can play a bit. Um, you know, they often come at a premium too. So maybe he's the next one off the Wickham production line. But I really feel that a great season at Wickham Wanderers will do him of the world of good. And, and if he can stay fit and get 40-plus games under his belt in a successful team, then uh, his reputation will rocket. Yeah. Do you think you'll bring in one more centre-back? You've obviously got Joe Jacobson who can fill in there. We saw him do a great job at uh, Port Vale um, in that position back in February. But would you expect one more maybe to cover for, for injuries? Yeah, I mean, Joe Jacobson can play there. Jack Grimmer can play there. But like you say, they're, they're sort of fullbacks by by nature in terms of their the lar- large parts of their career. Uh, especially centre-back, I wouldn't be surprised if we do uh, bring some uh, someone else in there. Um, again, you look at the the, the injury record of, of, of Farino and Tafazoli, um, and the amount of games. You know, we played fifty two games last season, and we didn't really go deep in any of the cups. In fact, we did. I think we got to second round of the League Cup. That was the furthest we got. Um, so yeah, fifty two games is, is still a, is quite a big, um, uh, big, big run of fixtures. So I would uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we if we got another centre back in. Yeah, well, hopefully they can uh, bolster the squad. Um, Lewis Wing, I, I um, it, it, actually, I was quite surprised to learn he was uh, out of contract this summer because I was under the impression beforehand that he was under contract because it looked like he um, played a really important part in the change of style that Matt Bloomfield wanted. And I saw sort of snippets at Bristol Rovers of Lewis Wing instigating some really good moves on the edge of the final third. And then you brought in uh, your Campbells and McCleary's and then you brought in um, Chader Bauer and Brandon Hanlon and it looked quite exciting. Um, Lewis Wing could be tough to replace, couldn't he? Yeah, he's a championship level footballer. I think he showed that last season. Um, and again, another great job by Wickham Wanderers. Here was a player um, who'd fallen out of love with the game. Um, needed a home, needed an arm put around him. Uh, and Wickham Wanderers was the environment um, that provided that for him and has, has put him back. Um, well, you know, we, we don't know where he's gone yet, uh, unless I've missed something while I was away. Um, but I'd imagine he'll be looking at a championship berth next season. Um, and, you know, his show reel at Wickham Wanderers, uh, Lewis Ping, as he's known as by a lot of our fans, you know, he can put him in. Yeah. For- 
Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he scored some phenomenal goals. I mean, the last day of the season, fantastic strike away at Pompey, uh, the goal at home against Derby. You know, he, he weighed in with some exceptional goals, some important goals as well. Uh, and I think he showed in, in you know, throughout the season that he can roll his sleeves up and get stuck in with Josh Goen. Uh, they had a real bromance together on the pitch as well. Um, mm. I think Lewis said that Josh was the best player that he played with. Uh, and Josh uh, uh, returned that compliment too. And they really complimented each other's style um, really, really well. Um, but I think, it, again, it just highlights the environment of Wickham Wanderers where you can have someone, you know, who's a long way from home. Let's not forget, you know, he's a boy from the North East. Um, it, it'd been at other clubs in the North and not settled. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday fans are uh, pretty derogatory about him. Um, but at Wickham, he, he moved down and um, and and settled quickly, uh, and and really showed what he could do. And I know Wickham Wanderers fans will be looking at the rest of his career uh, with a keen eye to see where he goes. Yeah, such an incisive passer, isn't he? As well, um, you mentioned Josh Scowen there. There has been reports that uh, Mr Ainsworth has uh, has some interest in him at QPR. Um, he'd be a t- tough one to replace, wouldn't he? Because he was such an important player last season when he was fit. Huge. And like you say, look, you know, you look at our results when he's playing and starting, um, you know, the stats bear that out. Uh, fantastic player, uh, very much under contract at Wickham Wanderers, if anyone's interested in that. Uh, so there would be a fee if he was to go. I've not heard any of these rumours. Uh, he has been at QPR before. Uh, QPR fans not overly enamoured with with Josh Goen. Uh, and again, a bit like Lewis Wing, Josh Goen loves the environment at Wickham Wanderers, very happy at Wickham Wanderers. Um, uh, in terms of on the pitch and off the pitch, hugely important, uh, and was very much the star of our kit reveal video as well. So uh, maybe Hollywood will come calling one day. Yeah, absolutely. Get Ryan Reynolds on the phone. Um, not in that yeah. respect. I'm talking about making movies. I'm not interested in going to Wrexham. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he's got a, a bit of an actor's uh, a bit of an actor's quality in it. Um, <laughs> let's. Um, are you excited for, for next season for, for Wickham and uh, and where this journey could go and whether it could be as, as thrilling as the last? Always. Absolutely. Always. You know, we should always remember that, you know, our club is in, in professional football in League One. We're sitting on our 30th anniversary of entering the Football League under Martin O'Neill. Um, you know, that's our that's that's the entirety of our of our professional era. Um, you know, we're in League One. We've just had our fifth highest position in the club's history. Uh, we've shown that the magic can happen by getting to the championship. Um, so we know it's possible. Um, you know, we're at the start of a new cycle. Um, and uh, and we have American owners whose outlook on life is very uh, different to your archetypal English football fan um, of the glass is half full, where uh, we have a cultural clash here. I think it's fair to say that, that, that fans of English football clubs, uh, especially online, on social media, uh, tend to find the negatives. Whereas... Uh, I know last season Rob Kuig was derided by a lot of our fan base by saying he fully expects us to get promoted, um, and he doesn't understand fans who, who don't don't agree with him. Uh, and I'm absolutely sure he will come out with that exact same statement this season uh, because you know he's in a competition uh, where we all start on the first day of the season uh, with the same amount of points, obviously Bar Wigan slightly behind us. Um, but in terms of you know the race, uh, the start lines where it is, the finish lines where it is. And if you're not backing yourself to win at the very start of that, then why are you even entering that race in the first place? Um, so I understand the mentality of Rob coming from it from his American viewpoint. Uh, and I understand the cultural clash between some of our fans not understanding that equally. Um, but, you know, football is football fandom and being a part of a club, you know, no matter where you are in the ladder, in the, in the scheme of things, is a great thing. It's your identity of the town. It's everything. Uh, that it should be, it's going to the, as a fixture list we've seen now, we know where we're going to be. We're going to be going around into all these great clubs and having, hopefully, making a great account of ourselves. And yeah, why not? We've shown it in the past that we can do it. Um, we've got a fantastic uh, manager who knows the club inside out, who wants to achieve um, absolutely more than anybody else. Um, I've never seen anybody more driven and hardworking as a player. I knew Matt as a player. I knew him as a coach and now I know him as a manager and incredibly focused, incredibly driven. Uh, and I know that he will do absolutely everything to make sure Wickham are as high up that table as they can be. Um, I think with the recruitment of, of a, a, a head of recruitment for Wickham Wanderers shows a, a change of approach uh, and a difference in strategy. I'm looking forward to seeing how that pans out. And obviously those roles, they look 
ahead, don't they? They're looking three, four windows in advance as well as this one as well. So there's there's more to come down the line as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this strategy evolves. Uh, a bit like how we talked about the development team being in implemented at the start of the Keurig raid. A lot of people were sort of, what does this mean? This won't work. You know, what how this or some people are incredibly excited. And we've seen two people trot off the development line already uh, with more to come. In fact, Christy Warden uh, has already done so. So, so yeah, so, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing how it evolves and, and develops. And, you know, it's never dull at Wickham, Gab. Um, what I would love this season, and I know I speak for a lot of the fans here, and uh, I'd love a cup run. We've not had one for a while. We've had, obviously, we've been concentrating on league issues. That's the last one. Yeah, uh, that was round four. We because uh, we were in the championship, we had the the, the joy of going in at round three. Um, mm. We had Spurs in two thousand sixteen, um, round four when we when we went there. That was a you know that was that was our last real I would say great cup hurrah. Well, there was um, Leicester in two thousand and one, wasn't it as well? Yeah, well, semi final against Liverpool, where we were very unlucky not to get a result that day, um, mm. and uh, you know. I mean, who, who knows? Uh, I did say that our last away game was at Carlisle on April the 20th, but I did have the caveat that that's also FA Cup semi-final weekend, so it could possibly be me. <laughs> Ever the optimist, Phil. Um, you have to be optimistic, Gab. Yeah. Got to be optimistic. What, what's the point otherwise? Um, great to chat to you, mate. Uh, just one final question from me. Have you got uh, What are the content plans for Wickham Wanderers and Wanderers TV for 23 24 season can you give us in any any little exclusives or yeah yeah rob the chairman has set us the uh, not insignificant target of doubling our output uh which i'm looking forward to doing uh, i've already lost all my hair so i can't <laughs> uh so uh yeah i mean that that is very much the plan obviously we want to keep the quality up as high as possible um we're in the final year of the current tv deal so wondrous tv match day coverage uh, we're looking to build on the incredible work we did last season and uh, yourself, you played a part in that as well, along with many others and, and salutes for that. Um, so we're looking, yeah, match day coverage again, looking to build on that. Um, we're going to implement a post-match show um, for home games um, where we'll be doing that live, but also as a listen again as well. Um, as well, Ringing the Blues uh, is changing slightly. Uh, it's becoming a live show on a Tuesday uh, which will then obviously then go out as a podcast as a listen again as well. Um, and uh, lots of other excitement around um, the video as well. I'm hoping that um, with the uh, getting quicker at editing and other bits and pieces, uh, we'd love to develop a bit more of a long form, perhaps maybe documentary style approach to certain issues around the game in a, in a non-regular format. But there's going to be an excellent sort of uh, menu of regular stuff throughout the season uh, uh, we're looking at a, a League One style show based on on the division going out earlier in the week. Uh, we have our pre-match drill show, uh, which we're going to be looking to build upon as well. Very much using the the uh, much maligned match day program, uh, which we don't provide at Wickham Wanderers anymore, uh, but using that as a blueprint, as we have done really on Ringing the Blues and a lot of Wanderers TV content, but using that to kind of you know bring that into a digital age a bit more. Uh, and again, fans watching this, if there's anything that you think we're not covering that you are missing from your match day program, we'd love to kind of get that digitized and, and put into what we do on Wanderers TV. Um, and yeah, looking to, um, you know, get to know the players away from football. That's the bit that I love. Obviously, we cover the football uh, every kick uh, and head of, of, of the season. But what I really enjoy as a journalist is getting to know the players, the people around the club, the fans finding those stories and, and those unique things to football um, that, you know, I always say I'm, I'm terrified of, of, of the community in Wickham losing its football club um, because it's the heartbeat of the club. It's the only place really where you get all walks of life coming together. And, and let's not forget our overseas community. Well, as well, well, it is all walks of life because people can't drive into the ground because it's one way system. So Absolutely. Yeah. You have to, walk there, you know, uh, you know, and you know, there's another, there's another narrative that's coming to this season is, is the road, uh, it's the access road and, and the story of that. And, and we'll be following that very closely as well. Um, but yeah, our overseas community is growing um, exponentially, which is wonderful. And, and due to the wonders of modern technology, they're involved in Match Day. Uh, there's a great article in When Saturday Comes this, this month uh, of a Walsall fan who now lives in South Africa, who writes beautifully about the experience of following on what is Walsall I follow. And he sums up the what I think uh, the experience of an overseas fan is of building that community and making someone 5,000 miles away feel like they're at the game and they're part of what's going on. 
Um, from from Accra to Accrington Stanley. Well, mate, I set them up. You had them in at, uh, at Gab. How's that? Yes. I, I've just realised Accra is in Ghana, I think, but, I've, but we'll, well, we'll, we'll, we'll go with it. I'm sure there's a Wickham Wanderers fan there too. So, Yeah, absolutely. Um, Phil, such a pleasure to chat to chat Wickham Wanderers with you. I absolutely love the content Wickham have um, produced on their official channels over the last two or three years. So all credit to you, Matt, and the team. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for joining us, mate. Always a pleasure, Gab, and equally um, keep shining a light on the on the on the glamour divisions that are League One and League Two. It's where the real competition and real stuff. We don't need this fancy Premier League country-owned football clubs. League One, League Two, that's where it's at. Keep it up, mate. Ah, uh, cheers, Phil. This has been EFL debate, the Wickham Wanderers summer deep dive with Phil Catchpole, and we'll see you again very soon.